In this video, I'm going to walk you through some of the intro chemistry vocab. We'll talk about scientific notation, accuracy and precision, and then I'll show you how to do some percent error problems. Before starting chemistry, it's good to have a working definition here of what chemistry is. You know from biology that biology is the study of life. Uh, so chemistry is the study of the composition of matter and how it changes. All right. Now, since living and non-living things are made of matter, chemistry affects everything. It's not like biology where you're just studying life. In chemistry, you're studying matter, which is life and non-life. So it has a lot more going on here. Uh, chemistry can be used in a lot of different ways. Obviously, it's very important in pharmaceuticals, uh, making you know medications and stuff. Sometimes you know one little difference in a drug takes the drug from curing your headache to go into something that might kill you. So you have to be really careful. There's a lot of chemistry involved in hair care products. You know, whatever you want, you know, the specific product to do. Do you want it to, you know, straighten your hair? Do you want it to make it curly? Do you want it to make it shine? So there's definitely a lot of chemistry in there. And if you're someone who's into art, to get all the different colors uh, and the different pigments, you have to use uh, usually pretty precise chemistry here. So chemistry does affect a lot of different areas of our lives. I just want to show you the five branches of chemistry here. Uh, these are different areas of chemistry that you could study. You might study some of these areas if you go on and work with chemistry more in college. Organic chemistry is a big area of chemistry. Uh, typically, if you're going to be in the medical field, science field, you're going to have to take organic chemistry and you're just studying carbon, essentially. So literally, there's an entire class that just focuses on one element. The study of carbon is organic chemistry. Pretty big um, branch, um, definitely a tough science class for many people. Inorganic chemistry is then where you're studying everything that's not carbon. And then you have analytical chemistry, which focuses on the composition of matter, you know, how things um, are composed here. So like if you were somebody that was drawing blood and then you're analyzing the components of the blood, uh, seeing if somebody was, you know, drinking or on drugs or something like that. That's a form of analytical chemistry. Biochemistry is just like it sounds. It takes kind of the life part and puts it together here. So you're looking at the different processes in uh, life or different organisms. And then physical chemistry looks at the mechanisms, rates of reactions, and the energy transfer that takes place when these reactions take place. So these are the five different branches of chemistry that you need to know. On this slide, I'm showing you some more vocab here. These are the two different types of chemistry. These are not branches of chemistry. This is just literally talking about how you could learn chemistry. So pure chemistry is when you would just literally sit down, study chemistry, try to learn as much of it as you could, you know, go through the textbook and absorb as much knowledge of, as possible. Whereas applied chemistry is when you take that uh, chemistry knowledge and actually put it toward a good use. So maybe trying to develop a new drug or something like that. So usually in uh, this class, we try to learn obviously as much chemistry as we can. And then we do try to put it to good use in the lab. So we, we obviously aren't going to make a drug with it, but we're going to try to use the chemistry and use the knowledge in a lab setting. There's two different types of observations I want you to be aware of, just in case you ever see these words in lab. Um, but again, if you use the words here, you pretty much can figure out what these are. We have qualitative observations, okay? So these would be observations that look at the qualities or characteristics of something. So if you were just observing something and looking at its color, smell, okay? Use the word to help you. So qualitative starts with qual, sounds like qualities. Whereas in chemistry, we do a lot more quantitative observations as well. You're probably used to doing qualitative observations in biology, but we're going to be doing quantitative observations in chemistry. We do qualitative uh, in labs, but we are more of a numbers science. So quantitative observations are when you actually are, you know, measuring something, getting a number with a unit, so like a mass or a length. And quantitative observation starts with quantity, okay? So it looks like quantity in the name there. So you definitely need to know the difference between these two. I just want to briefly talk about scientific notation real quick. This is something that you should have seen in previous uh, math classes, so I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this. But the basic reason we use scientific notation is because it allows us to write really big numbers 
or really small numbers here using a little shortcut. All right, one of the numbers we use in chemistry later on is a massive number. It's 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. And if you had to write that number out every single time, that would kind of be a pain. So we use scientific notation here as kind of a shortcut. The key is you always have a non-zero digit followed by a decimal place and then whatever remaining numbers there are times 10 to a power, all right? You must have a number that's not a zero followed by a decimal point. That's the proper way to write scientific notation, all right? So if you have, say, two digits and then a decimal point, you know you didn't do your scientific notation correctly. You need one number that's not a zero followed by the decimal point. And then you can write the remaining part of your number times 10 to the power, all right? All you're doing is moving a decimal point left or right, and you're counting the spaces you move it, all right? If there's no decimal present, you just assume that it's at the end of a number and you would put it in. If you move the decimal to the left, your times 10 to the power number is gonna be a positive number. And if you move it to the right, the times 10 to the power number is going to be a negative number. All right, so we'll look at some examples here. This is just something you gotta get used to, uh, something you need to know. So you have some options here. You can just memorize this uh, left and right, or you can kind of use logic here as I'll show you when we go over an example. So for our first example here, you can see our big number here. There's no decimal point uh, here, so you have to assume that the decimal point is at the end of the number here on the right. So remember, scientific notation is just moving that decimal point. So you have one number that's not a zero followed by the decimal point. So right now you can see there are a lot of numbers and then the decimal point. So we need to move this decimal point. We're gonna have to move it to the left, okay? We're gonna move it that direction in order to get one number followed by the decimal point, all right? So as you move it, you just count. So I'd say, okay, here's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, until I get one digit and then the decimal point, okay? So if I rewrite this, I would have three point and then you write the numbers that are left that are not zeros. So I'd have six, five. And a string of zeros would come off, okay? So I have one number here that is not a zero followed by the decimal point. That's exactly what I want. And then I times 10 to the power of how many spaces I moved it. So when I was counting, I counted seven spaces. So the answer here would be 3.65 times 10 to the seventh, all right? Notice I used a positive number because I moved to the left. If you go left, it's gonna be positive. There's a little logic you can use here if you mix up the positive and negative. Think about this. If you're looking at this example uh, in particular here, you have 3.65 times 10 to the seventh. So in your head, you could say, okay, 10 to the seventh would be like 10 times 10 times 10 times 10, okay, seven times. So that would be a massive number. If you took 3.65, times a massive number, you would get a massive number, which is what you started with. So you know you must have done this right. If you had 10 to the negative seventh, let's just say you messed it up and you did times 10 to the negative seventh. In your head, you should be saying, well, 10 to the negative seventh is a small number. If I took 3.65 times a small number, I would end up with a small number, but that's not what I started with. So you can kind of memorize the left and right thing, or you can look over your answer and use logic to figure it out, all right? The key is you're moving the decimal space, the decimal point, and you're counting the spaces, and you want one number that's not a zero followed by the decimal point. Write whatever numbers are left times 10, and make sure you're keeping count of uh, the spaces you move the decimal point, and pay attention to the positive and negative. That's basically scientific notation. So I want you to try these four examples here at the top, okay? Put them in scientific notation, pause the video and try them. When you resume the video, I'll have all the answers there and you can see how you did, all right? So pause the video right now and try those. All right, so hopefully these are the answers you got, all right? So again, pay attention here to the fact that all of these have one digit that's not zero followed by the decimal point. And then whatever non-zeros are left until you get to your string of zeros are there. And then you're timesing 10 and you're timesing it by the power of the number of spaces you move. Okay? So just be careful here. Like for in this first example, we moved this decimal space to the right. Okay? And we moved it five places to the right. So it's times 
10 to the negative fifth. All right, if you're moving to the left, it's positive. If you're moving to the right, it's negative. And again, you can use that little trick I showed you on the previous slide uh, where you can kind of check your work here and think it through. All right, so hopefully those are the answers you got. Be careful with scientific notation. Sometimes you might need to take a number that's in scientific notation and put it in standard notation. All right, so you just kind of do the opposite as before. So if I look at this example here at the bottom, I have 3.13 times 10 to the sixth. All right, so this is a positive exponent. So that means in order to put it into scientific notation, I moved it to the left. So if I wanna get it out of scientific notation, I have to move the decimal space to the right, all right? So I have to take the 3.13 number and move the decimal place six spaces to the right to get it out of scientific notation. So when I rewrite this, I'm gonna get three and then one, three, zero, and then three more zeros. That would be six spaces to the right. So 3,130,000 would be the answer here in standard notation. And if I check my work, it does make sense. If you took 3.13 times 10 to the six, 10 to the six is a large number, you should get a large number as your answer here. So you just gotta remember if you're putting it into standard notation, you're moving the decimal place opposite of the way you would have to put it in, all right? positive uh, exponent, you would have moved it to the left to put it into uh, scientific notation. So you move it to the right to get it out of scientific notation and then opposite there for the negative. A couple more terms here I need to point out, uh, accuracy and precision. If you're talking about accuracy, you're talking about how close you are to the true value of something, how close you are to the real value. That's talking about how accurate you are. And then precision, is actually when you need a series of measurements and you compare how close they are to each other, all right? So if something's precise, you've done a couple of measurements and those measurements are all very close to each other, all right? So if you have um, measuring instruments with more numbers after the decimal point, those instruments would be more precise. Obviously, we want both. We would wanna be accurate and be close to the real value. And if we redid the measurement multiple times, we want those measurements to be very close to each other or precise. This is just showing you some examples here using um, darts and dartboards. So if somebody had good accuracy and good precision, all right, basically when I throw three darts, this is pretty much what it looks like over here on the left, okay? All three are dead in the center and they are all close to each other. So they're very accurate because they're close to the center and they're very precise because all three are close to each other, all right? If you have um, good precision but poor accuracy, that would be like this middle picture here. You're not hitting the center, but all three darts are very, very close to each other. So that's precision, but not accuracy. And that's very easy to fix. With a slight adjustment, all right, you would have all three of those darts in the center, okay? And then the one here on the far right, this would be an example when you don't have either. They're definitely not accurate and they're all over the place. They're not close to each other, so they're not precise. That's a little bit tougher to fix because you kind of have to make a bunch of adjustments here in order to get that um, to be precise and accurate. You could pretty much apply accuracy and precision to any sport, but here's an example with golfing. All right, if you hit the ball um, from afar and you got all three in the areas that you see here, uh, that would definitely be pretty darn accurate. All right, in the grand scheme of thing, you're pretty darn accurate and all three are pretty close to each other. So that would definitely be uh, precise as well. Here's an example with golfing where um, you're not as accurate. Obviously they're not as close to the hole, um, but they are definitely precise because they are very close to each other. A little bit more here about precision. Anytime you have more numbers after the decimal point, that's a more precise measurement and you're gonna have a more sensitive uh, instrument here. All right. So if you were looking at these two masses of silver, obviously the one with more numbers after the decimal point is more precise. And you can see that if you were, um, you know, selling this, obviously, you know, 1.2354 grams is much more accurate than 1.2 grams. Uh, usually, typically, the more numbers you have after a decimal point on the balance, uh, the more expensive that electronic balance is going to be. So if you look at these uh, three down here at the bottom, if you could pick out the one that's the more precise measurement, okay, which one would it be? So 
we said here, the one that would be the more precise measurement is the one with more uh, numbers after the decimal point. So this 4.609 liters would be the more precise measurement. The last thing I want to talk about in this video is percent error. All right, a percent error is when you're comparing a measurement to its accepted value. You did some kind of measurement and you want to see how close you were to the real value. Essentially, it's telling you about how much you were off. So the equation here that you need to know for percent error is you take the experimental value, okay? So that's typically going to be the value that you found, okay? And you're going to subtract the accepted value or the real value, okay? This is the known value it should be, and you're subtracting that, all right? But notice these lines here. Those are absolute value lines. So if you ever subtract and you get a negative, you know you can just make it positive. You don't ever get a negative percent error. That's the biggest mistake people make with this. They give a negative percent error, all right? So we're not doing a negative percent error here, okay? So we got to be careful with that. Um, and then you divide that by the accepted value, and then you times it by 100, okay? So you got to be very careful here with this. People mix up the experimental and the accepted values, all right? The experimental is the value you are measuring, and the accepted is the real value here. And then you just got to do your math here and make sure it's right, all right? So let's jump in, do an example. Uh, this one says that Sally found the mass of a 34-gram sample to be 32.7 grams, and we want to know the percent error in her measurements. All right, so you do need to know this equation. So I just remember it a little shorter. I just remember E minus A all over A times 100. But you have to remember here that this E minus A is the absolute value. You can never get a negative here. All right, so again, you have two numbers in this problem. The hardest part is picking out which one's the experimental and which one's the accepted. So you have to sometimes, you know, read the words here very carefully. This problem is telling you Sally found the mass of a 34 gram sample to be 32.7. The problem is essentially telling you that the sample is 34 grams, all right? That is the accepted value, but she found her experimental value to be 32.7, all right? So the experimental value here is the 32.7 minus the accepted, which is the 34, all right? All over the accepted, which is the 34, all right, absolute value here when you subtract, you can't get a negative times 100. So at the very least here, when you're doing this problem, this is what you would need to show. You should show the equation and show your setup. You can do the math in a calculator, but you have to show the setup. If you're not showing work for these problems, you are not going to get full credit. All right, so you have to show the numbers you're plugging in here. And then just plug this into the calculator correctly. Sometimes people mess that up. So how I would do this is I would do the 32.7 minus 34 first, hit equals. Obviously, it's negative, but you can ignore it or make it positive. Divide it by then the 34, hit equals, and then times by 100, all right? You might get, you know, some long decimal numbers here. It's okay to round these. It's okay sometimes to even make them whole numbers. It's not that big of a deal. So when you do this, it does come out to be about 3.82%. OK, if you did, you know, 4 percent or 3.8 percent, that's not a big deal. Even if you went some more decimal places, it's really not that big a deal for this. The key is it needs to be positive and you need the percent sign because this is a percent. All right. So know the equation. That's the first step. Show your work. Don't mix up the experimental and accepted and then do the math correctly. Always circle your final answers and don't forget the percent sign.